Okay, that's us. Um, welcome to you all. Uh, every year, the uh, program committee introduces some new ideas and some get incorporated into future ACLs and some don't. We hope this one will get included. It's Rising Stars and, uh, oh, maybe I can take this off. Um, there's Rising Stars. We've got three in-person Rising Stars and two virtual Rising Stars who will come in uh, uh, on electronically. Um, so we've got, I think it's 12 minutes for each talk. Then uh, we have three minutes for questions. We'll probably take questions from the audience if there are any, and then go on to uh, people coming in from, uh, from outside. Our next two rising stars uh, are appearing virtually. Ryan uh, Cutterell uh, from ETH uh, Zurich is the uh, first of the two virtual speakers. I think they're so this is a problem. If we, if we can't see the slides, we're going to have even more of a problem for our virtual speakers than for our human in-person speakers. So I hope this is going to work. Orion? Oh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. So are you ready for my, my hot take on uh, sampling from probabilistic text generators? Uh, so before I start, I want to thank my amazing collaborators, uh, Clara, John, and Tiago. Um, so unless you've been running, living under a rock for the past few years, it will certainly not have escaped your attention that large language models, or as I like to call them, probabilistic text generators, are all the rage. Here is an example on this slide. This is a screenshot of GPT-2, that is one such model, on the Hugging Face website. And you can see it sort of has this creative interface where you enter a prefix of a text. For instance, the chicken crossed the road because, and it gives you various completions of that text. So the question I'm going to treat in this talk is, what is a good algorithm to generate this text? Now, if we pop up a bit and we talk about the general problem of probabilistic text generation, we can decompose it into two parts. The first part is the modeling part. And the modeling question is, which probability distribution should we generate text from? We could choose a left to right causal language model, a closed language model. We could globally or locally normalize our language model. We have very many different things we could, we could choose between. In fact, if you look at the performance over the last couple of years, you can see as the arrow of time goes to the right, um, <clears throat> we have ever larger language models in terms of parameters and language models that can scale and train on more data. And what we've noticed is that the test perplexity, that is how well these models predict held out test, text, is going down. And that's really, really surprising. However, there's another aspect aspect to text generation. And that aspect is what decoding strategy should we use to generate the text? That is, how do we actually get the text out of the model? And in this case, we also have a wide variety of choices. For instance, we could use ancestral sampling, beam search, or if your architecture has some sort of special exploitable structure, we could use dynamic programming. So the literature abounds with these sorts of strategies. And this talk focuses on decoding. And the reason I find decoding so interesting is that we have all these algorithms that in a sense are superficially similar, but which one you choose uh, just completely changes the results. Okay, so let's review some of the proposals from the literature. Um, so if we focus in on a traditional left to, light, left to right language model that decomposes the probability of utterance, in this case, Y, as a product of conditionals, um, the decoding problem is roughly this. If we're trying to generate text in a left to right fashion, the question we're asking is, how do we choose which token Y at each time step? And there are lots of different ways we can do this. The simplest way that we might consider choosing a token Y is greedy search. So greedy search is a very simple rule that says at every time step Y, I'm going to select the argmax. So as simple as it is, it's, it's pretty useful, but it a lot can really go wrong. For instance, Greedy search will often lead to dull or generic text. It's also prone to repetitive loops. Another strategy that's been proposed is ancestral sampling. And there's a sense in which this is the right thing to do because it's actually sampling from the model. It's sampling from that model that we think is so great because it puts high probability on held out text. So the ancestral sampling rule says just draw your Y according to the distribution. However, a lot can go wrong with ancestral sampling too. For instance, we can often sample from the tail of the distribution which might lead to text that is not relevant or nonsensical. And building on ancestral sampling, a lot of researchers have tried to patch it up. 
For instance, one proposal, top K sampling, is a very simple fix that says, we're gonna sample a token with probability proportional to the original distribution Q, but we're going to zero out everything that is in the top K most probable, uh, probable tokens at a given time step. So this generally generates higher quality text, a result that's been um, replicated by a wide variety of researchers. However, we still occasionally observe degenerate behavior like repetitive loops. Okay, so now I'm gonna change directions slightly and I'm gonna talk about um, an information theoretic view of language. Now, the idea here in terms of the roadmap of the talk is I'm gonna to talk to you about information theory for about five minutes. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how some of these principles um, that come from information theory can be used to design an even better decoding strategy. Okay, so natural language, as, as should be relatively obvious, is the primary means of human communication. In fact, I'm communicating with you guys here through human language. On the other hand, information theory is the mathematical study of communication. So it seems like it's logical that information theory should have something to say about natural language. Concretely, in this talk, I'm going to ask two questions. Um, the first is, can information theory help us determine when automatically generated text is human-like? The second is, can we use information theoretic concepts to generate more human-like text when we decode our probabilistic text generators? So let's start by taking an information theoretic view of language. So if we view language as communicating through a channel, that is, I have some communicative intent that I wish to express, I encode it, in a model, or sorry, I code it in a sentence, and then I, I speak it or I write it, and you as the listener have to decode it. If we think about language in that very information theoretic way, I argue that we end up with two principles that guide what should make a good sentence. The first principle is that information should be transmitted efficiently. The second principle is that sentences should be chosen so as to avoid miscommunication. Rephrased more colloquially, these principles state that, uh, that we should keep sentences short and information dense on one hand, but on the other, we should avoid moments of high information, which are hard to process. These two principles trade off. That is, if we have short information dense sentences, we will naturally have moments of high information, which we sought to avoid. So I'm gonna propose a solution to you. I'm gonna argue for it on an intuitive basis in this talk, because it's a relatively short talk. Um, so the solution is this. Our goal is to have an algorithm that selects sentences that are around the average information content. Intuitively, this should make sense because if, if an utterance is around the average information content or locally around the average information content, then it should be relatively information dense. It's around average, but it also should have also sort of avoid moments of high information. Okay. So I wanna say a bit about what's so special about average information. So average information often goes by another name, a much more common name, entropy. Um, and just to introduce a bit of notation that we'll use in the next couple of slides, in the case of probabilistic language generators of the form I discussed earlier, it is most natural to talk about the time step dependent en uh, entropy. That is, we have some conditional entropy typically denoted by H, and this is the expectation of the information content. Uh, and information content in this context is the negative log probability of the individual token. Okay. So I'm going to shift gears again and move towards um, some of the, the recent results um, that we have. So I'm going to introduce the, inspected, uh, the expected information hypothesis. So this is work that's being presented at, uh, at this very conference tomorrow. Um, and I want to introduce it in a picture. So the expected information hypothesis works like this. Um, so imagine these two people are having dialogue. The person on the right seeks to communicate something to the person on the left. The person on the right says, or thinks subconsciously, I don't really want to spend all my day trying to get across one simple idea. So my utterances should be really high information. However, I also don't want to overwhelm my listener by throwing too much at them. And these correspond exactly to the two principles I said before. And what our, our work does is we sort of make this a much more formal hypothesis. What we say is that every word in a generated sentence should have an information con should have information content that is close to the conditional entropy of the distribution over words given prior context. That is, we can say there exists some epsilon greater than zero, such that the distance between the information content of the individual token and the entropy is less than epsilon with high probability. So I want to introduce one more definition that'll be useful. So the question you might ask then is, what is the set of tokens that meet this definition? We call them locally typical tokens. And we write it like this, uh, tau epsilon. And we say that's the set of tokens 
that have information content close to the entropy. It's less than epsilon. So we get this free parameter epsilon that we get to choose. Now caveat, I want to choose a caveat here that this is not the standard definition of typicality that you'd find in an information theory text like Cover and Thomas, but it is related, hence the name. Okay, so now I want to get into a bit of the empirical evidence we have for this hypothesis. So here I'm presenting you with three graphs. Uh, each graph shows the, um, the difference between the entropy and the information content of an actually human written sentence on a corpus. And we can see that this is centered around zero, which says there's very little difference. And we can see that the variance is relatively, the relative peak distributions, there's low variance. So this tells us that people tend to actually write sentences around this, this sort of, uh, around the average information content. Okay. And if you're still curious about this work, you can definitely check out the, the presentation tomorrow. Um, and Clara and Tiago, who are around, would be more than happy to ask, answer your questions. Okay. So in the final bit of the talk, I want to move from typical, uh, move on to an algorithm. That is, I want to move from a hypothesis to an algorithm. And this is algorithm we're going to call typical sampling. And the paper link is up here if you're interested. Okay. So here's a new decoding strategy that we propose. It's very simple. The idea is going to be we're going to take something like top K sampling, where we only sample something if it's in the, but we only sample something if it's in the typical set at each time step. That is, we zero everything out and we renormalize the distribution. This is a very easy method to compute. In fact, you can compute these locally typical sets in O of V time. It's very fast um, <clears throat> and uh, it appears to work well. For instance, if you look at the numbers, uh, we found that our method on two different tasks, abstractive summarization and story generation, outperforms to competitive uh, competing methods, nucleus sampling and, and top K sampling. So that's our method. Uh, and we've looked at a wide variety of metrics here, including several automated metrics, as well as a human evaluation. In terms of a qualitative evaluation, I want to say a bit about this. Here we have at the top, we have a prompt, which is something we feed into the model. We have a reference sentence, and we have several different outputs um, several different uh, uh, re, uh, re, um, texts that were generated by various algorithms. So what we found qualitatively was that typical sampling bears some resemblance to the output of beam search. And we thought this was quite interesting because we recently proposed uh, an information theoretic um, explanation of beam search two years ago. So we sort of have come to this conclusion that information theory has a lot to do with what sentences we ought to be selecting from these models. And it's really an important problem to figure out exactly how it should be formulated. Um, so as we come to the end, I'd like to try to enc uh, encourage you to try out typical sampling. Uh, it's in Hugging Face, the Hugging Face Transformers library. You can scan this QR code up on the right and go right to the source and try it out today. Um, and I really hope you read the papers and feel free to ask us questions if you have any. Great. Brian, thanks so much. So now we're going to see whether the, uh, the speakers are such that uh, Ryan can hear us. There's one person who's standing up, but I can't see who it is. Hello. It's yeah. Mark from Estonia. Ryan, thanks for your talk. And I'm going to ask a question for Bonnie. Uh, what about discourse? So uh, your hypothesis of every sentence uh, it, uh, being supposed to carry the average amount of information uh, sort of breaks the idea of, you know, not uh, transferring the average amount or the optimal amount of information per sentence, but actually getting your intent or uh, changing the view of the person. And for that, you might need to prepare them, dilute it with smaller sentences and that, uh, you know, how communication goes. And since your numbers support your hypothesis, then wouldn't you say that it would depend on the domain of text we're talking about? So if it's, let's say, informative text, then it works. And if it's more creative ones, then it doesn't? Um, I mean, it absolutely depends on the domain and also the listener. For instance, if I'm trying to convince you of something, for instance, that this might have uh, something to say about our methods and our, our hypotheses might have something to say about uh, discourse, then you know I'd have to present you with information in sort of small chunks to build up to, to accept our opinion. But we haven't actually looked at that. I mean, I think the relationship between discourse and information theory is quite interesting, but I don't know that much about it. That's Thanks. Good. Okay, we have, I think we have time for one more question. Hello, I'm Antonio Valerio Michelibarone from University of Edinburgh. 
Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, when you sample from uh, using an ancestral sampling, it is my understanding that you know that we at probability you get a typical uh, sequence according to the standard uh, definition typicality. But if I understand correctly, here yeah, you are using a different definition. Can you explain what is the difference? Yeah, I can explain. That's that's a very this is a very technical answer to that. Um, so language. So the, the short answer is that um, because we have the EOS token in language models, we don't have an ergodic Markov chain. So the typicality theorem, the more generalized one than you find in Cover and Thomas, um, uh, the one due to Breiman, is won't apply. Uh, so it, it only applies. A more standard notion of typicality would only apply to these models if it were the case that we could um, not, if we could get out of an EOS. That is, we could have a sample of sentence break and then start taking new words. Because otherwise. If you think of this as a Markov chain, EOS effectively means you have an absorbing state. Thanks. Good. There's a question. I can't tell whether it's a short question, whether it's a question that can be answered shortly or one that's going to take a while. Um, typical decoding for open domain dialogue would be like talking to a person who always speaks in fancy words. True or false? That two of false is what I, I think. I think it depends on the context now, doesn't it? If they're trying to be, too, I mean, sometimes dialogue in fancy words, like I imagine a, a Jane Austen novel might be the appropriate level of informativeness, and sometimes it might not be. Okay, another short question, and then we'll go on to our last speaker. The question is okay, people interact differently when talking with agents. Does your hypothesis take that into account somehow? Um, and I think by agents, they mean uh, uh, computer agents. We've never actually tested this in a dialogue setting. That's quite interesting. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, it's it's almost like a, a weird pragmatics thing. Like we have to model how the human would would interact with us, given that they know we're, uh, the model is not a human. So we didn't we didn't consider that setting. And I, I don't think I have a very informative answer um, at but the moment. Worth thinking about in the future. About, yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Ryan. This was... Delightful, really good, delightful. Um